morning. Welcome to RPC. It's great to see you all here today. Um, we have gathered together today to worship an unseen God. And I think we need to acknowledge up right that that's, uh, that's a challenge. Um, while he is unseen by our physical sight, he is not unknowable. In ancient times before iPhones and uh, FaceTime and Zoom, people wrote letters. And uh, they would often build strong relationships just by corresponding via letter with others that they had never seen. And this dynamic of the unseen uh, would require a more intentional type of communication and would often result in, in more robust relationships than, than what we have today with all our technology. So let's keep that in mind as we consider the words that our unseen God has written to us and to think about our own words in response to him. So let's do that through Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. <laughs> Know that the Lord, he is God. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Let's pray. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Grant us an undivided affection for you, even if it is just for this short time that we spend together this morning. And having tasted and seen that you are good, I pray that you would increase that desire in us more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.
be seated. As we approach our most holy God this morning, it's good for us to confess our sins together before him. Let's do that together. Let's confess our sin. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have been and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no Now hear these words of assurance. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. This is good news for us this morning. Now I invite you to stand again as you are able as we continue our worship. You ready? 
himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. It's our privilege and our honor to be a part of what God is doing, not only here in our area, in our region, but also what God is doing all around the globe. And so this morning we have special privilege to hear uh, from Reverend Emmanuel Mulundo uh, and to hear what the Lord has been doing um, in and through him this summer in East Africa. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's a privilege, Alena, to be here again, to stand before you and to share what the Lord is doing overseas, especially in the land of Kenya and Uganda. I left here in May 2019th for mission trip and I returned on July 7th. So in those many weeks, it's very hard to put it in the time I've given, but hopefully in the future, because I traveled crisscross Kenya, Uganda, and I was in many, many places. I was in churches, I was in prisons, I was also in youth group, married retreats, and other things that, but I'm going to show you partly, it's not uh, short of the what I did, specifically, because it relates to many of you here who have been given, giving and who gave for the work that is under the ministry of She Saved the Nation, that is reaching out to the girls in schools, 
do the sanitary um, ministry that they provide. And so I'm going to give you just a few slides on that. I visited two schools during that. I was in Kenya from May 22nd and till June 8th. So all those times I was in Kenya, but we went to these two schools specifically because it relates to what RPC gave, and I took that to the people, uh, the ministry down in Kenya. And so in that nutshell, let's see the slides. And my theme this year was in Luke 10, verse, so hopefully it works. This way? Or the, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about it. It's not? Okay. As they bring it over, and they look nine verse, there it is first. Okay, you might. Okay. Luke to 10, verse 2, it says, and he was saying to the disciples, and the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few, therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in the harvest. So that is, you see myself there. I am here. And this is the first school. These are the supplies you sent through your giving, sanitary pads, soap, uh, lotion, and other things. And these are specifically that was a... a you call it elementary school in Kenya, they call it primary school. And these are the people who are glad to receive, you'll see some of it. So here we go. And this is the gentleman who is in charge, Pastor Mugo, director of Serves the Nation. He was here, but I wasn't here in the States visiting a daughter. And uh, after this, so we, what we do, we get the audience and the school and they give us the kids who are we share with them so and then later on we give so this is the a, a principal and that's the daughter of the pastor mogo and myself so this is what we do after we have shared and then they leave the girls who are going to receive again there it is then we went to another second school. This is in uh, near Mount Kenya. It's far, like two, 400 miles north of Nairobi, the city. It's near that Mount Kenya where people, if you like, those who like to explore, you can go up and see the snow. And this is, that is the, down there is uh, the boxes. As you see, they are the same. We buy them in, and then we transport them. And this is a, she's the principal, and this is the wife of Pastor Mugu. And there they are, usually it's. And this gentleman here is going to be the administrator of that primary school. This school was started after these of the children who are displaced because of hunger, so they started this. Around here, you couldn't see another slide that yeah, in my, I have a lot of homes around this area, shanty homes. These kids go to this school. They are home, most of them were homeless. So this is the new principal. I mean, this is the principal, this is the administrator. And there I am with the boxes, sorry. Same. And this is where they have the girls come up and then we, they share. And here you see Pastor Mugo's wife. There, she's sharing the word, which is very interesting. In those schools in Kenya, you're allowed to share the word of God. And that's the first thing they do in the morning. So, still in Uganda, still the same. So, the word of God is still available to those kids. So, they share, and then later on, and she was sharing specifically, she also shares about how other things relating the girls before handing over the items. So my thing is, uh, 
as I wind, I went to other places, but second as I say to you that I went to prisons, but because of uh, uh, the inmates and because of security, we never took any pictures there. So you might wonder where I was, where, but I was privileged to share some people, these in, the inmates were, some of them are on capital punishment, but some have come to know Christ while they are in jail. They have a big church. I was surprised. I mean, we are fewer than here. There were like 700 people in that church, inmates, and they're all singing about Jesus. And when I asked one person who had killed many people, what is your hope? He says, I came to know Christ, and I know that even when I die, I'm going to be with him. So, prayer requests. Uh, Bibles are really in need in those two countries. If you have any way to get those Bibles in, we would appreciate. They need Bibles. English, they love it because it's, English is this national language. So in prisons and in also in schools, they need the Bibles. I couldn't, the few funds I had to buy a few Bibles, but everyone wanted their own Bibles, Bible in their hands. Secondly, pray that God sends out laborers. As I said, the harvest is plenty. I went there. I could see the work of the God among the youth. And they say in Africa, the continent, the population is going to expand. By 20, I think, 30, they say we'll have 1 billion people on the continent. That's the population of India almost. But they say most of them are young, will be between the ages of 18 and 35. So you can see the explosion. So the church has to catch up and see what we can do. Both in Kenya and Uganda, they are growing. And also remember the church in those two countries, as they have few resources with COVID, what happened? They are limited resources so that God will open doors. They are very excited about evangelism in schools, in prisons, and all other places, and they're also going out. They are not sitting, and their theme is to always to go out. That the opposition, there is a lot of money being poured in by Arab countries. They are building mosques. So if you think there's there are nothing happening, they are doing underground work, building even shopping malls done by Arab countries because of the petrol gas money and then they're also doing uh, activities what we call here wanna. so they do it in very settled in the manner they are doing it so remember them that the opposition is there but it's very low and finally I want to thank RPC the family for your support and without you standing with me during these times and many times I've gone before, and I just want also to thank God for my wife. She, has, she wasn't able to come, she's working. She, she stood with me in those times that I went long time and also this time. By the way, while I was there in July 25th, we celebrated 30 years of marriage. So there was something we were able to share Together and also the song we sang was our song on our wedding, Gloria Things of the Year Spoken. So that was, thanks, Kevin, for we didn't plan this. It's all by God. So I leave you with this text, which always touches me in Philippians 1, 4 to 5. It says, always offering prayers with joy in, in every prayers for you in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. So may God bless you, and if you have any question, maybe we can talk later. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, let's take a moment now. Let's stand and greet those who are around you.
Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, again, we're glad to see you, whether you're with us or whether you're watching from home on Zoom or YouTube. Uh, this time, the ushers are coming forward to hand out the attendance uh, tablets, so if you would be so kind as to sign in, let us know that you were here. Uh, if you'd like to include some contact info, if we don't already have it, um, be a way for us to say hello to our visitors. I um, did want to uh, read a note that was passed along. This is from Ellen Latcher. Uh, many of you know Ellen. She says, to our RPC family, heartfelt thanks for your cards and prayers. Your love has made my journey with heart disease less painful. Finally, I will be admitted to LGH on Friday, August 26th, and open heart surgery follows on Monday, August 29th. This is a big surgery for me and Glenn, your continued prayers and support will be wonderful. So uh, please keep both of them in mind. Um, so that's be this coming Friday that she goes in, and the surgery is a week from tomorrow. So she went in Thursday, got the all clear. Um, so we'll be mindful to be in prayer for both Ellen and for Glenn. We also received a note this morning, it did make it into the bulletin, that Marie Ida Miller has tested positive for COVID, is in the effort of hospital. Uh, Glenn has tested negative, so they would appreciate your prayers at this time. We can add them to our very lengthy list of, of uh, people from our congregation that are suffering in one form or another right now. So let's go before God in prayer. Our Father, we, we bow before you, uh, the awesome creator of the universe. And though through uh, modern technology we get glimpses of the vastness of all that you have made, uh, we know that we still see so little. And while you are so far above and beyond us, uh, you have stooped down and you care for us and demonstrate your love through your son, Jesus. And even though you have shown this amazing love, we still, like sheep, are easily distracted. Uh, we wander off for what we think are greener pastures and they always turn out to be weeds. So thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for uh, continuing to forgive our drifting and faithfully bringing us back to yourself. Father, as, as we mentioned earlier, there are many uh, in our flock who are facing surgery or recovering from surgeries, uh, grieving various losses and walking through illness. We just ask, Lord, that they may experience your watchful eye and your caring hands as they go through this uh, trying time in their lives. Bring healing, we pray. Lord, we pray now as Kevin teaches your word, we pray that you would empower him by your Holy Spirit, that we would all leave here with a new gratitude and a fuller understanding of Jesus and a new resolve to love and serve him. We pray this in his name, amen. The ushers will now come forward and receive the morning offering.
Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those are familiar and comforting words for many. And maybe especially so when the shadows seem to be growing longer. Psalm 23 is one of the few psalms that has no plea, no request. It's not asking the Lord to do anything. It's just a simple statement of the goodness of God. It doesn't say, oh, please be my shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to read from John chapter 10, also a familiar passage to many. This is John 10, verses 1 through 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Again, familiar passages having to do with sheep and shepherds. But we need to begin this morning by looking at the other main characters of this passage in John 10, which are the enemies of the sheep. We see right at the outset that there's a thief and a robber. And in verses 10 through 13, we get a glimpse of what they do, these enemies. There's three main enemies of the sheep. In verse 10, we learn that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. The second enemy of the sheep we find in verse 12, it's a hired hand. He's a hired hand and not a shepherd. He does not own the sheep. And he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The hired hand leaves and flees. He flees at the sight of hardship, of danger. He says, I'm out of here. Because he does not care for the sheep. They're not my sheep. I don't know them. I'm gone. He's indifferent to the needs and the safety of the flock. The hired hand values a paycheck over the sheep. He values his own life over the sheep's life. 
Now, the third enemy of the sheep is the wolf. What does the wolf do? He snatches them and scatters them. And we could probably assume that from there the story gets a little more grisly. Three enemies of the sheep. Now, the context of this story is a shepherd, who Jesus says is me, and sheep who are his own, God's people, the church. And so we could say that God's people, the church, have three enemies as well, or perhaps three categories of enemies. Thieves, hired hands, and wolves. Thieves and robbers who are outwardly and obviously opposed to the church. They're opposed to the gospel. They're opposed to the Lord. These are just the most obvious ones. Just obvious enemies, people who explicitly just speak ill of the church, who rail against it, who say it's all a fairy tale. It's all ridiculous. It's all immoral. These are people and ideologies and even other religions who are opposed to the message of the Bible, who denied the Christ. And again, these are usually really apparent and obvious to us. We see them, we recognize this is obviously an enemy of the church, an enemy of Jesus. The other two enemies can be harder to spot. Hired hands, as we see, are people who have some position of authority and have a task to care for the sheep, but they don't care. They're not shepherds at heart. And when we're speaking here of the church, mind you, remember, we're not speaking of RPC in particular. We're speaking of all of God's people, okay? So the church, universal. So don't get, you know, like, oh, he's got something in mind. He's got someone that he's thinking of this morning. No, it's just this is broad application to all of the church. There are pastors who are just in it for a paycheck, who the ministry for them is just a relatively stable, easy thing. Now, 2020 has weeded out some of those, but there are pastors who take a position predominantly as a stepping stone for career advancement. That happens. They're hired hands. There are elders and other leaders who just like having power, who just like having influence. Again, I'm not talking about RPC. Try not to get specific examples in your mind right now. Just speaking broadly, some that we need to be aware of and on guard against. And to pray for these people that they don't fall into this. There are Sunday school teachers who have agendas but no loyalty. There are church members who feel some obligation to show up, but when the going gets tough, they don't stick around. These are all people who have a role to play, who are part of the body of Christ, who ought to be caring for the sheep in some capacity, but show themselves to merely be hired hands who split, who don't really care. And the third enemy or third category of enemies of God's people, of the church, are the wolves. You'd think these would be easy to spot, but sometimes these are the hardest to spot because... As Jesus says in Matthew 7, they often wear sheep's clothing. So they can be hard to detect. They profess the faith. They take vows. They join a church. They serve in the church. Perhaps faithfully. Perhaps for years. But eventually their colors show. And they cause, as it says, scattering. They cause division through gossip, through slander, through whispering campaigns designed to bring down and divide. They love to plant seeds of doubt. They relish drama. They take pleasure at taking down. So in contrast to these three enemies, on the one hand, we have, on the other hand, the good shepherd. As we read this passage, we learn a lot about the good shepherd 
you could, I counted seven attributes, depending on how you count it. If you, well, you can kind of combine those or divide that one. You could have six or eight. But seven's a really good number. So if you can ever get seven into a sermon, you just go for it. So seven attributes of Jesus the shepherd. And they come in two clusters. The first cluster of attributes are in verses three and four. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. First attribute of Jesus, the shepherd. Jesus knows his sheep. He knows them. They're not strangers to him. Secondly, he calls his sheep by name. By name. Third, he leads his sheep. And fourth, he goes before his sheep. He knows his sheep. He calls his sheep by name. He leads his sheep. He goes before his sheep. Now, it says he knows and calls his sheep by name. Now, don't get too literal on this. Because somebody out there, I know, like an elder or a pastor, forgot your name one time, and you just want to hold it against them forever. Look, I forget my own kids' names half the time. So don't go, don't go too literal on this. But a good and faithful shepherd will make at least a good faith effort to know the sheep. Speaking of elders and pastors who are tasked with that sort of thing, they make a good faith effort to know the sheep, to know their tendencies and their personalities so that they know how to best care for them. Now it's really, really hard, if not impossible, for one person to know 100, 200 sheep, well enough to be really of much good. That's why several years ago, we took a third of the elders and we took a third of the deacons and said, okay, together, you're going to care for this third of the church. And we literally took the directory and said, okay, you're A through whatever it was. And so we split into like these three shepherding teams is what we called them, with the hope that among those handful of elders and deacons working together, they can know a reasonable amount of the sheep of our congregation and know them well enough to be able to minister to them well. But Jesus is the good shepherd. He can know all of his sheep by name because he's the God man. He knows us all by name. He knows us better than we know ourselves and can minister to us accordingly. He leads his sheep and he goes before his sheep. There's a sense in which the good shepherd leads by example. Jesus showed us the way. He is the way. He showed us how to live. He showed us how to die. He's the first to experience resurrection. As we follow Jesus, as we walk in his ways, we experience all those things as well. We follow that same pattern. And in his life, he experienced everything we experience. And he wasn't a backseat driver just sort of telling us what to do. I have one of those in my house. Dad, you're going too fast. Just a little. No, not just a little. When kids learn to read, it can be a real problem. Jesus doesn't just sit back. He doesn't dictate from a soapbox. He gets into the fray. He experienced every pleasure, every hurt, every forsakenness that we do. You know, there's a statue about a quarter mile that way of Dick Winters. And the plaque on it says, follow me. That was his phrase. If you've seen Band of Brothers, you know, he just said, follow me. And he'd just jump into the battle. Jesus plunged into death so that he could lead us the way through it. He goes before us. The next cluster of attributes begins in verse 9. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Fifth attribute of Jesus, the shepherd, he saves his sheep. He saves them. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus gives life to his sheep. 
verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Seventh attribute, Jesus lays down his life for his sheep. You could argue that the rest of this paragraph is really him just explaining what that means to lay down his life and how he lays down his life. In verse 13, he compares himself to the hired hand who cares nothing for the sheep. The insinuation is that he does care for the sheep. He lays down his life caringly. In verse 15, we read that he lays down his life for the sheep. He does it for them. It's a vicarious laying down. He lays down his life vicariously. It's a fancy word. We looked at that in Isaiah 53 at the beginning of the summer. Something you do for someone else. To live vicariously through someone. He, He dies vicariously. He lays down his life for them, for their sake. It's not just he just sort of does it hopes for the best. It's for their sake. It's a particular purpose to it. And then he says in verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. He lays down his life specifically. There are specific sheep that he lays down his life for because he knows them by name. He says, there's sheep in this other fold. I know them by name. They're the ones who I will will know and I will call. I lay down my life for them, for particular, specific sheep. In verse 18, we read that no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He lays down his life voluntarily. This wasn't forced upon him, he wasn't coerced. It wasn't a guilt trip. He laid down his life voluntarily. He did it willingly. And lastly, he did it authoritatively. I have authority to lay it down. And, take a little peek ahead, I have authority to take it up again. He has the authority to lay down his life so that he can be raised again. These are the attributes of Jesus, the shepherd. This is how he lays down his life for his sheep. If we just want to look big picture here, just in a simple summary of John 10, what's the difference between the enemies of the sheep and the shepherd of the sheep? The enemies have it all for themselves. They're in it for themselves. In one form or another, they are the ones that hope to profit from the sheep, either as a meal as a paycheck, whereas the shepherd of the sheep is in it for the sheep. The sheep benefit. He does not. That's Jesus, the good shepherd. So let's turn back to Psalm 23, that familiar passage to us. Look at how it begins. The Lord is my shepherd. And you might see in your Bible that it's all caps, the word Lord. If you look up two verses, to 22, Psalm 22, verse 30, posterity shall serve him, it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. That, that Lord is not all caps. When it's all caps, this is written in Hebrew, that means it's um, translating the, the divine name, the actual name of God. Not just sort of the generic word Lord, meaning master or whatever, but the divine name itself, which, by the way, no one knows how to pronounce because they didn't pronounce it. The Hebrews didn't pronounce it. It was too revered as too holy to even pronounce. So they would just say Adonai, which means my Lord. So we translate it in our English, the Lord, but we put it in all caps to denote that this is the divine name. Sometimes we just sort of say it as Yahweh. Or in the past, people used to say it as Jehovah. Okay, but this is the divine name, the Lord. And the Lord here is put in the Hebrew in the emphatic position. 
It's kind of like if we were to italicize something, to kind of emphasize it, okay? The Lord is my shepherd, as in not anyone else is my shepherd. It's the Lord who's my shepherd. It's Adonai. It's Yahweh. It's none of the false gods. It's not they all. It's not the Egyptian gods. It's not the wolves. It's not the hired hands. It's not the thieves. It's Yahweh, the Lord. That's the one who's my shepherd. There is one and only one good shepherd, the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. And as we read in John 10, Jesus is the good shepherd because Jesus is Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The good shepherd provides for his sheep so that they have nothing to want any further. They lie in green pastures. Now, normally in the Middle East, if you want to eat grass, you have to search for it because there's not much of it. And so the life of a sheep and a shepherd was a lot of wandering around. To lie in a green pasture represents abundance. Still waters means abundance. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. He's our good shepherd. He nourishes us. He provides for us. And in verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me, just as Jesus the good shepherd does. He leads us. He goes before us along these paths of righteousness. You might have a little footnote in your Bible. If you look down, it says, in right paths. Not paths of righteousness. There's actually no, not necessarily a moral connotation to this. Not he leads me in some sort of morally right way. It just means simply the right way, the right path. The way I should go. Morally and otherwise. He leads me the way I should go. This is a statement of trust. Remember, this is, there's no plea here. It's not please lead me in this way. It's you do lead me in this way. He, the Lord leads me in the right path. It's a statement of trust that he's leading me well, that everything that has come behind me and everything that's before me along this path is right. Now, some of you might want to think back on the path you've walked in the last 12 months, last week, the last couple of years. And perhaps you've asked yourself, is this really the right path? It seems like it's been a hard path, a not-so-fun path. Are you sure, Lord, this is the right path? The next verse says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, connect that to the verse that we just read, he leads me in the right path, even though that that path goes through the valley of the shadow of death. That's the faith of the psalmist. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know this is the right path. That takes a good measure of faith, does it not? I'm sure we have all struggled with that at some point probably recently. Are you sure, Lord, this is the right path? The psalmist says, yes, it is. And you may have another little footnote there in verse 4, the shadow of death, or quite literally means the valley of deep darkness. It's a dark valley. Think of the Middle East, topography there, the, the deep valleys is often where the most grass is. One, because the sun doesn't strike as hard to scorch the grass. And two, because valleys are where water tends to flow. And where the water is, there's more vegetation. So deep valleys tend to have more things for sheep to eat. 
There's also more things that eat sheep in those places. The best grass is in the deep valleys, but also the most dangers. And sometimes the right path, the path that the Lord has ordained for us to walk, sometimes goes through darkness. Sometimes deep darkness. Sometimes pain and hurt and danger. But that's where he feeds us. That's where we grow. And the psalmist says, David says, I will fear no evil. And we need not fear evil. The evil, the word for evil there in the Hebrews, the word ra'ah. Last fall we went through Jonah. It's a prominent word in Jonah. A lot of double meanings going on there. It can mean moral evil in the sense of just wickedness, but can also mean evil in the sense of just really bad things happening. Calamity, destruction, ruin. A hurricane is an evil in that sense. He says, I will fear no evil. I think he means more in that sense. He doesn't not fear evil because it doesn't exist. He's not saying, ah, there's no evil, there's no worry, there's no danger here. No, absolutely there is. Absolutely there is, but the psalmist knows that there's blessing in the valley. That there's joy in the sorrow and there's redemption on the other side. You remember the story of Exodus? God's people are in slavery in Egypt. God raises up Moses and through Moses, he leads them out of Egypt. And all the people said, yay, bye-bye, Pharaoh. And they turn around and there's the Red Sea. That's a big body of water. And they're kind of going, Moses. This doesn't seem like the right path, Moses. But walking with the Lord is a bit of an adventure, is it not? And sometimes the Lord asks us to dive into the deep end while he yells, trust me, I'll catch you. Psalmist says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Oh, evil exists. And when you're in the dark valley, you know evil exists. But I will fear no evil. For you, the Lord, are with me. I remember going backpacking and sitting in my tent in the middle of the wilderness during a storm. And it was scary and kind of miserable. I also remember another time I went backpacking and I sat in my tent in the middle of the wilderness in the middle of a storm, but I had a friend with me that time. And it was all just kind of part of a fun adventure. That's what the presence of another person can do. Now imagine the presence of the Lord and the ability that it has to calm all our fears. The waves will not capsize the boat if Jesus is in it. And when you walk through the valley of deep darkness, you need not fear evil because Jesus is in it. He is leading you. He is guiding you. He is showing you the way through. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod beats away enemies like wolves. And the staff nudges us in the right direction. Sometimes yanks us in the right direction. Depending on how stubborn we are that day. Because he saves his sheep. That's what a good shepherd does. 
Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Even in the midst of enemies, in the midst of ra'ah, in the midst of evil, the provision of the Lord is overabundant. It is cup overflowing abundant. And so he ends by saying, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we follow the Lord, no matter how difficult the journey may be, we have a sense that this is the good life. This is the good way. Even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, this is the good life. I love hearing the testimony of seasoned saints who can look back over their life and all the trials that they've been brought through, all the evils that they have overcome by the grace of God, and to hear them say, this is the good life. When we wander off, when we get enamored by the things of the world, we're either seduced by the pleasures of life or we're angered by all the frustrations of life, we lose that. We lose that sense. But praise be to God, our good shepherd is there and takes his staff, hooks it around our neck and gets us back on the right path. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's just a statement of fact. Because the good shepherd is who he is and does what he does, therefore, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is simply what's true. It's the good life. This is the good shepherd and there is no other. And despite my heart, which is prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. He will hold me fast. For how long? Forever. Just a word of warning to us all. There are many fake shepherds today. I hope you know that. Now you do. There are many fake shepherds today They promise protection. They promise provision. They promise a path. It might be a politician. It might be a weight loss program. It might be a loved one. But they cannot and they will not be a good shepherd. Even elders and pastors who take on a shepherding role, they do so as an imperfect reflection of the one true good shepherd. And even the best ones will fail you because they're human. There is only one good shepherd who will never fail you. It's the Lord. Adonai. It's Jesus. Psalm 23 is a bold statement. It's a bold proclamation. We tend to think of it as sort of a sweet or sentimental psalm. But it's actually a bold statement. This psalm stares death right in the eye and says, I will not fear. That's bold. John Golengay writes this. He says, the life of a member of God's people is lived between unfettered enjoyment of the presence of God and of the precariousness of life. We aren't fools. We know that we live in the shadow of death. Some of us know that more deeply than others. But we should be realists. We know that we're one breath from eternity. And we should be sober-minded about the frailty of life. But on the other hand, we're not pessimists. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be gloomy. Debbie Downers, the sky is falling. 
No, we should be joyful because of our shepherd. We should be resolute because of his rod and his staff. And we should be comforted in the confidence that he will lead us through the valley. I'd like for us to close by reciting Psalm 23 together and aloud. So we have the slides up there, and we'll do this as a, as a closing prayer. In many respects, this is a prayer. It's a statement speaking to the Lord. So let's recite, let's pray Psalm 23 together, and then we'll sing our closing hymn. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Please extend your hands to receive this benediction taken from the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, 
equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. By way of announcement, please uh, remember the extensive list of people in the bulletin inside uh, under Family Matters for Prayer and Praise. Uh, quite a few people going through dark valleys right now, and we need to uphold them in prayer. Also, uh, on the back of the bulletin, there is uh, an announcement regarding the Moms Park series. Uh, there's been a change. Uh, they're going to be meeting at Beringer's Drive-In uh, in, at 11 o'clock on Tuesday instead of Fox Meadows. So note that change. Um, congratulations again to Josiah and Alicia Weaver. There's a, a sign-up for meals for them that you can still uh, help out with their uh, new adjustment. And also, congratulations to Ed and Karen Boat, who are brand new grandparents, to copy Liller, Lily Huden, born to their daughter Caitlin and her husband Joe. So um, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you about their new grandchild. <laughs> and then lastly, uh, the Pastoral Search Committee would like some feedback from the congregation. Um, you can see the information in the back. There will be someone standing, uh, Amy and Roger, will give you a hard copy if that's what you desire. If you're a little more techy, you want to scan the QR code on the back of the bulletin. Um, so there's various ways that you can uh, communicate uh, what you're thinking and what you're looking for. And then also there will be uh, some folks in the Narthex Library. Uh, if you have any other questions that you would like to have answered, you can uh, speak to someone back there. Okay, you're dismissed, and have a good Lord's Day.